Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. have arrived to episode 119 and you can find any links for this episode at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 119 okay let's talk shakespeare let's talk hate and fearing of shakespeare you know it you've seen that look in your students eyes so many students hate and fear shakespeare and let's be frank so many teachers hate and fear shakespeare and i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that learning Shakespeare in a classroom is so often done sitting down at desks, silently reading, silently struggling, (laughs) trying to look up words that we no longer use in a form that we no longer speak in. It makes total sense that teachers and students would hate and fear this. It's boring. And it's not the way that Shakespeare would have wanted it, right? In Shakespeare's time, actors did not sit around and analyze the plays. They didn't even get the whole play. They got their cue line, their line, and the line after. They didn't have a lot of time to rehearse. They were up on their feet and moving. That's the key to Shakespeare. So how can you get your students up on their feet and moving? Let's find out, shall we? Here's my conversation with teacher, actor, physical performer, director, and drama teacher academy instructor, Todd Espelin. All right. Hello, podcast listeners. I am here in beautiful Kalamazoo, Michigan. I actually, this is a treat because this is a podcast interview that I'm doing face to face and I have face to face with me, Todd Espelin. Hello, Todd. Hello, Lindsay. I noticed you laughed a little bit when I said beautiful Kalamazoo, Michigan. I did. It is beautiful. (laughs) I thought you were making fun. No, of course I'm not making fun. I've spent many times in Kalamazoo because you and I have known each other for uh, many years. I think it's 96. 90, I was going to say 96. Todd and I met at the International Thespian Festival where we were both guest artists. And we met myself and Craig and uh, Todd and uh, his wife, Allison. And we actually, Allison Williams, who you all know as uh, one of our prolific playwrights. And we were both sort of to ourselves mumbling about a show and then we mumbled together didn't we yeah we were we were uh sitting in the booth and Alice and I were not happy with the show and there was a couple sitting two or three chairs away and in the crying baby booth at this theater. And yes. We weren't like in the middle of the theater saying. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. In the, uh, the overflow booth. The overflow booth. And, and then we all, we started talking together. And then it was a beautiful, a beautiful friendship. So you've been teaching for quite a while. Yeah. I was brought to Kalamazoo, Michigan to be a, a sabbatical replacement at Western Michigan University in 2000. And I discovered I really like teaching. And uh, after that, I was a guest artist in residence at Kalamazoo College from 2002 until 2010. I wasn't working full years. I was spending some time touring shows and, and directing shows around the country. But I, from 2002 to 2010, I at least taught uh, two or three classes for them a year. What is it about teaching that really appeals to you? I, I mean, I've had a really good time being an actor, and it's been fun, and I've experienced a lot, and I've experienced a lot of personal growth. And what's really great about being a teacher is helping students experience that same level of personal growth and teaching them to unlock their hidden wells of creativity. I know that sounded totally cheesy, but I really mean it. It really is. It's the best part I find of any teaching experience is when, and again, it's totally cheesy, when the light goes off in their eyes and they go, oh, oh, and you've helped them come to that realization. Yeah. And I mean, this is not to knock people who are, are, you know, my friends who work professionally or whatever, but there's a level of, of mundaneness that comes to the work or you're going to work when you're putting on a play or directing a show or acting in a show. There's a mundaneness that happens and it doesn't make the work any worse, but it's really cool to be around people who get really excited by the work because you've unlocked something in them. I think that there's no other group which is more interesting to write for as a playwright and also teach with because just because of that, because they're so excited and when they get excited, they're not afraid to show it. Yeah. You do a lot of movement stuff, yeah. a lot of Canadian stuff. Yeah. You went to the Delarte School. Yeah, I went to, well, it, it's a really weird route. 
I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I... Oh, so you're the one. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one. <laughs> well, I didn't... I mean, I lived there since I was 14, so I didn't really grow up there. But um, I went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and was studying traditional theater school at a traditional theater school. And a guy that I was in class with was... He was a mime. Uh, I'd like to point out that Todd just... Did my hands? With, I did my with, hands with his hands. Uh, he, he was a mime, and he used to perform in hotels and whatnot. And he needed <laughs> oh in Las, I'm like, in Las Vegas. <laughs> yes, I'm sitting there going mime in a hotel. hotel. Oh, Las, but in Las Vegas, like conventions. Yes, yes, and and <laughs> parties and stuff like that. Well, he got this gig being uh, Caesar's royal jester at Caesar's palace, and they wanted two. And he was like, I had a movement class with him, and he said, you move really well, and why don't you do this? And I said, okay. And it was awesome, because it was 1989 when Vegas was just starting to explore doing more variety theater in the hotels. So I was Caesar's Royal Jester, and I was dressed in a weird kind of toga-y thing, and with the guy who had been Caesar at Caesar's Palace for, I don't know, 20 years, and there was Cleopatra and all these performers, and then they had... um all these circus performers, and I shared a hotel room. It was our dressing room, which was a hotel room with myself and David, the guy who was my partner, and then a guy named uh, David Kesterson, who was a human mannequin, and a guy named Ming, who was from the the Peking Circus, who did this crazy balancing act. And so I, I was around all these circus people, and I went, this is pretty cool. And then I went on to become a chaplain impersonator at a comedy club. These are not typical jobs that you have in college. But the physical, like movement and yeah. physical is just really starting to hone in. Yeah. And so then I, I heard about, I went and took a workshop in, in Maine and I heard about this place, the Del Arte School of Physical Theater in Northern California. And I decided that's where I wanted to go train. It's a movement theater school. It was founded by a guy named Carla Mazzoni Clemente, the first teacher of Commedia Del Arte in the United States. And I got into there after college and went and trained with them. When you have this physical background, how does that translate into your teaching? How do you use it? I try and, well, there's the basic approach to acting in the United States is the Stanislavski method, which is from the inside out. Very thinky. Very thinky. Or you have a personal experience or an emotional experience and then you let it out. The crux of the physical work that we were learning at Del Arte and through Mask was all about either creating a very beautiful physical theatrical world that the play took in, took place in, or in the case of Mask, giving yourself a physical experience that translated itself through being physical into an emotional experience or unlocking emotional impulse in you. And so a lot of my work is about trying to straddle the line between internal work and external work. And even if I do dabble in internal work, I try and add an external component so that you're working from the outside in. So it's not just sitting there and look at me having an emotional experience that you can only see beyond my face so that it's, it's the whole body working. And this actually transitions, nicely done, really well into what we're really going to dive into today. And that is Shakespeare, teaching Shakespeare and about Mm -hmm. how so often Shakespeare is taught from that inside out perspective, isn't it? That it's thinky, thinky, thinky first till everyone gets bored to death and they don't do take that outside in approach. Right. So why and how can a teacher who is sitting and who is a high school teacher sitting, you know, in their classroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, who isn't comfortable teaching theater, how can they take an outside in approach? Well, part of it was, and I ended up as well as working at these hotels and whatnot, I ended up doing Shakespeare in college and working for a couple of Shakespeare festivals while I was in college as an, as an intern and a performer. And I just discovered a methodology of working on Shakespeare so that you can analyze the text and then apply that analyzation into a physical performance. Hmm. Do you want me to get more specific? Yeah, because like, I think that that's an interesting thought. Like, I think it's really interesting that instead of analyzing the text and then, you know, you read the text and then it's just, it stays very staid. But to analyze the text and then get up on your feet, I think that's something that is, that's really interesting. Well, one of the basic approaches to it is looking at the punctuation in the text. And there's, as I say this, there's tons and tons of different approaches. One of the reasons why I like this approach of looking at the punctuation in the text is it really gets to the heart of the matter of making uh, specific, personal, emotionally connected decisions. Shakespeare wrote, he wrote very fast, they rehearsed very, very fast, and we believe, and nobody knows exactly what was in Shakespeare's head at the time, because he never wrote about his process. Nor is he here to talk about and it. They, they, yes. Because <laughs> if not, I would say zombie. And then, <laughs> and, then, and then zombie Shakespeare would get up and he'd say, you know. You know, iambic pentameter. Um, 
So what we think is that he put clues in the text on how actors should act the text. Some of it is the way the iambic pentameter is written. Some word, some of it is word placement, and some of it has to do with punctuation. Because there's no stage Shakespeare that we know of. There wasn't really any a lot of stage direction. Right. You just only had the text to work with. Right. And isn't it true that when actors at his time too, they didn't even get a full script? No, no, they didn't. They got a roll. A uh, roll. Your your script was rolled up, and you got your cue line, and then your line and then the line after your line and that's all you got so you had yeah you had to listen (laughs) to the actors you had to pay attention i actually uh did a show like this in 1998 at kentucky shakes we everyone got roles everybody got roles yeah oh my gosh yeah it was the scottish play which i'm super superstitious about talking about yes if you don't know what the scottish play is you got to go look it up because we're not going to say it but the guy who played the lead in that tim his and it was the fourth time he played the role so he knew the role but it was a it was huge I think, oh my gosh, I think that would be such an interesting experience. Like, if you want to take Shakespeare to a new level, teachers who are listening, give your students roles, which, and it's so funny, because that kind of flies in the face of some other <laughs> uh, things that we teach students, which is, you have to read the whole play in order to understand your character. It's like, well, okay, so let's try this, where you just get your cue line and your line, and then the after line. Oh, you'd have to listen so hard. Yeah. You totally have to pay attention. You totally, totally oh. have to pay attention. I love that. Okay, back to punctuation. All right, so what we think is that Shakespeare, uh, and again, this punctuation is all theoretical because he didn't publish any of his book or any of his plays during his lifetime. His actors put it together. So we're still kind of hinting in the dark about what it could be. But, like, one of the big tools in there is, and it's it's a weird piece of punctuation that we don't often use, is the se- the colon and the semicolon. And one of the things is that whatever happens, whatever line is said before, like a semicolon, which is the dot and the comma, Whatever's said before the semicolon somehow triggers an an emotional response in the character for some reason. So that anything that happens after the semicolon is emotionally driven. It's a, the, a, an emotional impulse that's pushing it. With the colon, which is the two dots, whatever happens before the colon somehow triggers an intellectual change in the character so that everything after the colon is somehow intellectually driven. It's free of emotion. Oh, okay, so like... Well, that's something that you can actually play, isn't it? Yeah. That, that if you have a line and there's a semicolon, whatever comes afterwards is either going to be, well, emotion-filled or completely calm. Yeah. What's a good, do you have any good, I'm totally putting you on the spot. Do you have any good examples that we could, like, direct uh, teachers to? What a good, what a good speech be that has a lot of punctuation in it? Well, one of these, I'll, I'll talk about a specific speech, but one of the things that just occurred to me is, right now I'm, I'm editing down Richard III, because I'll be directing Richard III in spring. And there's a couple of great moments where, if you don't know Richard III, he's a bad guy. And he's completely putting one over on everybody in order to sort of stick a knife in their back. And there's a great moment where he's pretending to be really, really holy and really pious in Richard III. And he has a lot of semicolons while he's acting, being this sweet, nice man who only thinks about others. There's a lot of semicolons in this particular speech. And reading it through, it's really funny to me because it's clear he's saying he's approaching it from a standpoint of uh, trying to pretend to be emotionless and sweet and nice. But then when we get to some of his private speeches, he's got a lot of semicolons in there because... He's pissed. He's a hunchback. Everybody looks down on him. They call him a bunchback toad. And so that really drives him. Okay, that's one thing. That's the analysis where you look at a speech and you go, okay, here's punctuation. And here, for example, semicolon, emotional reaction, colon, intellectual reaction. Okay, so how do we, how do students physicalize that? What's a, what's a physical action they can take with a semicolon and a colon? All right, so the physical action and the way I've sort of broken this down to give us a, a simple place to begin working from is Anything that happens after the semicolon, which is the emotional response, one of the things I'll do is if I'm working on a speech or having an actor work on a speech is to begin walking. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of times we want to start working on a speech from sitting. And, I mean, acting's about real life. Even when we're giving a monologue in our life, yelling at our parents or arguing with a boss, it's not us coming at it from a place of of sitting and rest. It's, It's a place of action. So I like to get actors up and moving and doing this kind of nice, vigorous walk. And then when we get to that semicolon, I like to have the actors switch directions as fast as they can without thinking. So you're delivering the speech, you're delivering the speech. When you get to that semicolon, you just switch directions. And that does a couple of different things because we're reading, but our brain is trying to, our brain is trying to deal with this violent action our bodies have done. And I like to think that 
by engaging our physical apparatus, it allows us to travel deeper into that moment of emotionalness or emotional reaction by physically just acting in an emotionally uncontrolled way. When we get to the it for the the, the colon, uh, I like to have actors as they're doing this little walk when they get to the colon to stop, take a breath, decide what direction they're going to go in, and then go. Especially when we have the actor walking, 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 and stopping. There's a lot that happens to our physical instrument when we adjust in, in that way, and I and I like to think it gives the actor a moment to gear shift. Because a lot of times we think, oh, I got to keep acting, I got to keep acting, I got to keep acting, and we don't take those times to gear shift. And with this approach of switching directions quickly or stopping and being very meditative about where we're going to switch directions, I like to think that acts on our, our kind of our our inner impulse center where we're trying to act from. There's two things that come to my mind. One is that when you give a student an action to do instead, but in that emotional moment where afterwards there's an emotional impulse, instead of saying "be sad," yeah, "be happy," you're not dealing with the emotion or the thinky think. You're dealing with actually doing something. Yes, emotion's a byproduct. Emotion is a byproduct of getting what you want or not getting what you want. And what's great for for me in working with actors, or more importantly, what's great for me in working as an actor myself, is that when I get to that moment of the meditative shift or the quick violent shifting in the case of the semicolon, it makes it easier for me to go, oh, I'm going to play this action and attaching mm-hmm. an action. The next thing I'm going to do, am I, you know, on that quick violent shift, am I attacking or am I jumping for joy or vocally or whatever? Um, something to think about too is I'm also influenced by a guy named Tadasha Suzuki. If you're familiar with Suzuki method, the, the people who do Suzuki method founded the city company in this, this staging, um, process called viewpoints. Suzuki's physical method started out as a vocal method. And Suzuki said that um, the we, we teach voice and we teach movement, but voice and movement are the same thing. The voice is actually the body. The voice is the body, leaving the body, traveling across the room to your body and affecting your body. So whatever the body can do, the voice can do. So if the body can, if the body can hop and skip and jump, then the voice can hop and skip and jump. Yeah. And by using this methodology of the colon and the semicolon and this other punctuation stuff, I think it makes it easier for me, at least as an actor, to discover where the action is, either by playing the action and, and paying attention and going, oh, wow, it felt like I was punching there, or oh, it felt like I was tickling there, and then saying, well, why don't I try this next moment punching, or I'll try this next moment tickling or slashing, or that's well, my action. And so often with <laughs> students and working with Shakespeare, Everything tends to come across like a, a monotone vocally and also physically. They never know what to do. They're just, they stand still and they deliver as opposed to, you know, acting. <laughs> or, or worse, it becomes just really, it becomes really arm waving. Yeah. And because they think that they, students think that Shakespeare has to be done one of two ways. They get that weird sort of phony British accent. Yes. In, and everything becomes very declamatory or which I've experienced in working with uh, actors on every level of the yes. spectrum. And then actors, yeah, like you said, they get really monotone. I worked with an actor directing a high school production of the Scottish play. And this one actor, he, the whole time, he was really quiet and you couldn't hear him past the front row. And, and the whole time, and he was kind of mumbly too. And the whole time I kept giving him notes and I was like, what, dude, what are you doing? And I finally had to pull him aside at the end and just, instead of trying to coax a performance out of him, I said, you got to stop doing this. I don't know what you're doing. What's going on? And he had watched the Judy Dench, Ian McKellen version of the Scottish play, which if you've ever seen it, it's really dark and it's filmed all in close-ups. And oh, movie version. The movie version. Yeah, not the right. stage version, the movie version. Oh. And it was filmed all in close-ups and, and he, that was like the only Shakespeare play he'd ever seen. And he thought that's how you do Shakespeare. Cause you know, he was told Ian McKellen and Judy Dench are the greatest Shakespeare actors around. And well, that's how I must do it. You must do it mumbly in, uh, in, in, yeah. in close-up. Yeah. Okay. I think that's really excellent. And I think that um, using anything that we can do to get students physicalizing and acting, when you teach Shakespeare, I think that that's the road to go down, isn't it? To If you were going to give one piece of advice to teachers in teaching Shakespeare, would you say physicalization is, is up there? As, yeah. I, as I put words in your mouth? <laughs> yes, Lindsay, I would. Hang on, I'll do it. Yes, Lindsay, I think physicalizing is brilliant. I got in the middle of that sentence and I'm like, and when did that you stop beating worst, your wife? That was, yeah. <laughs> that was the worst question ever. 
No, I mean, I, I yeah, yes, I agree with you. Uh, uh, I drank the Kool Aid, but I the the thing I like about this method, and as I keep working as a teacher, is I'm constantly trying to come up with ways that students can do analysis, so that you're sitting and you're being thoughtful about the work, but then finding out how to take that thoughtful analysis and turn it into something that can be put on stage. Mm-hmm. And presented because all too often, I mean, I've seen a lot of movement theater people that I've worked with who it's all about just putting it out there, putting it out there, putting it out there, and there's not a lot of thought given to the work. And I think you got to find the balance. But I think that the analysis is there to serve the physical work as opposed to the physical work being there to serve the analysis. Yeah. The analysis has to be the foundation that you then build your house on. Yes, love it. And as we as we wrap up here, uh, if this is something that uh, that really gets you interested and is like, oh, this is something I want to learn more about. Todd is, uh, we're very excited that he is uh, teaching a course called Friendly Shakespeare in our Drama Teacher Academy. It's this and more, uh, just how we get Shakespeare, how we make it friendly, right? Like how we make it accessible. Yeah. And I want to thank you guys for asking me to do this because I love teaching this workshop and I love teaching this course in Friendly Shakespeare. And I'm really, really excited to be able to open it up to a really wide array of people so that, that this can get out there and people can start using it beyond just my teaching in class or teaching workshops. And that we don't get to, we get past the point of, I can't do Shakespeare or even worse, I can't teach Shakespeare. It's not yeah. accessible to me. It's not relevant to me when, in fact, it's so wonderfully relevant and universal. So any tools we can give, we're going to do, right? And I'm hoping that this can be a foundation for people to love Shakespeare, to explore it further, and to go into those other many other methods that are there to learn how to do Shakespeare. Yeah. You know, become a scansion nerd and learn all about scansion and see how that aids into back to the process that I'm hopefully laying a foundation for. Awesome. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you. Shakespeare Powerhouse. woo Thank you, Todd. Before we go, let's do some theater folk news. So I mentioned there that Todd is an instructor in our Drama Teacher Academy, and the doors are open for the DTA again, and we are accepting new members. Go to dramateacheracademy.com, dramateacheracademy, all one word, dot com. You can also find the link for this in the show notes for this episode, theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 119. Go there, check out the website, kick the tires, read testimonials from existing members. You can check out Todd's courses, Friendly Shakespeare and Big Picture Blocking, staging your play from the outside in. Check out other courses. You can watch a couple of modules from each course to see exactly what you're getting. Look through the lesson plan library. We want you to see what you're getting when you join. So there's no surprises. So again, that's Drama Teacher Academy, all one word, dot com. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk, and you can find us on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.